I Believe by Tuesday Love Sang Rampa, read for you by Blue Friend in beautiful B.C. Chapter 11 It seems to me that we are dealing with metaphysics in this book, spirits, ghosts, etc., so perhaps it might be of interest to tell you, not too seriously, of the tale of the innkeeper's cat. This innkeeper was quite a nice man, and a real stickler for obeying the law. He had a good old tomcat who had been with him for many years, and this good old tomcat, I think it was a tortoiseshell cat or something like that, but anyway, he used to sit on the bar near the cash register. One day the cat died, and the innkeeper, who was very fond of him, was absolutely desolated, and then he said to himself, I know what I'll do. I'll have old Tom's tail cut off and mounted in a glass case, and will keep it in the bar in memory of him. So the innkeeper had a friend who was a taxidermist cut off old Tom's tail, and the rest of old Tom was buried. Old Tom, the innkeeper's cat, had led a very good life. He had listened to all the people's talk as they came into the bar, and he had sympathized with the men who said their wives did not understand them, and all that sort of thing. So old Tom, being such a very good cat, went to heaven. He got up to the pearly gates and knocked on the door, and, of course, they were delighted to admit him. But then, oh, misery, misery, what a shock! The guardian at the door said, Oh, my goodness me, Tom, you haven't got your tail on. We can't admit you here without your tail, can we? Old Tom looked around, and was absolutely shocked to find that his tail was missing, and his jaw dropped down so much that he nearly made a furrow in the heavenly pastures. But the guardian of the door said, I tell you what, Tom, you go back and get your tail, and then we'll glue it on for you, and you can come into heaven. But be off with you now, I'll wait for you. So, the innkeeper's cat looked at the watch on his left arm and saw it was nearly midnight. He thought, Oh, gee, I'd better be hurrying, because the boss closes at midnight, puts up the bar and all that, and I must hurry. So, he rushed off back to earth, scurried along the path to the inn. Then he knocked hard at the door, and of course the inn was closed. So, old Tom knocked again in the way he had heard certain favored customers knock. After a few moments, the door was opened, and there stood the innkeeper. The man looked shocked, and said, Oh, Tom, what are you doing here? We buried you today. You can't come back like this. You're dead, don't you know? Old Tom looked sadly at the innkeeper and said, Boss, I know it's nearly midnight and very late for you, but I've been up to heaven and they wouldn't let me stay there because I haven't got my tail. So if you just give me back my tail, you can tie it on if you like. I'll get back to heaven and they'll let me in. The innkeeper put his hand to his chin an attitude he often adopted when he was deep in thought. Then he cast one eye on the clock, but of course only metaphorically, because he wouldn't have liked to cast his eye. He might have lost that and broken the clock as well. And then he said, Well, Tom, I'm ever so sorry, lad, and all that, but uh, you know how law-abiding I am, and you know it's well after hours, and the law will not allow me to retail spirits after hours. <laughs> well, after that, 
we should get back to the very serious business of writing this, which is the last chapter of this book. And so, the gentleman from one of those ancient little countries bordering along the Mediterranean. It was Greece or Rome or somewhere like that. I don't know where it was for the moment. But this gentleman stood upon his soapbox. Plinius Secundus was his name, and he was a very clever man indeed. He had to be, you know, he had to be very clever, because, as his name implies, Secundus, he was not the first, but the second. You've probably read of these car rental firms who advertise so glowingly in the papers. There's one in particular who advertises that they are second, and so they have to work harder. Well, Plinius Secundus did the same. He had to work harder to be cleverer than Plinius Primo. He stood upon his soapbox. I don't know what brand of soap it was, because the advertising man hadn't got around to labeling everything so much in those days. But he stood there, teetering somewhat uncertainly, because the box was flimsy, and Plinius Secundus was not. For a moment he looked about him at the uncaring throng, and then he said, Friends! But there was no reply. No one looked. So he opened his mouth again, absolutely roared, Friends, lend me your ears. He thought it was much wiser to ask people to lend him their ears, because he knew them so well. He knew they would not cut off their ears and walk on. If their ears stopped, so would the owners and then they would have to stay, and he wanted them to listen to what he had to say. Still no response. He stopped for a moment again, looking at the scurrying crowds, all hell-bent on getting here and there and everywhere else. Then he had a fresh approach. Friends, Romans, Greeks, Americans, but then he stopped in confusion, his mouth still opened. He had suddenly remembered, with a blush of shame, that America would not be discovered for centuries yet. Then, as no one seemed to have caught the mistake, he went on with his speech. Now, I am a very kind person, really. Some people think I'm an old grouch. Some people think I'm a hard-faced old so-and-so. I know that, because they write and tell me so. But anyway, here following is a translation of what Plinius Secundus said. It's translated for you, of course, because you would not understand his language, and nor would I. There is no law against the ignorance of doctors. Doctors learn upon their patients' shuddering bodies at the patient's risk. They kill and maim with impunity, and they blame the patient who succumbs, not their treatment. Let us do something to keep in check those doctors who would not obey the dictum that they should do no ill, that they should console the patient while nature effects the cure. Do you ever stop to think what a mess medicine is? It is, you know, it really is a shocking mess. Nowadays, the average doctor takes nine minutes to deal with the average patient, from the time the patient comes in, before the doctor, to the time the patient leaves the doctor. Nine minutes. Not much time for personal contact. Not much time to get to know the patient. Yes, it's a very strange thing nowadays. It was meant 
that doctors should do so much for the sufferer, but now, after five thousand years of recorded medical history, no doctor can treat a head cold. If a doctor treats a head cold, the cold can be considered to have ended two weeks after. But if the wise patient does not go to the doctor and just leaves the matter to nature, then the cold may be cured in fourteen days. Have you ever thought how the average doctor weighs up his patient? He looks at a patient carefully for all of about one minute, trying to work out how much the patient knows because years and years and still more years ago, Asclepius the Wise came to the conclusion that the more a patient knows, the less confidence he has in the doctor. If things had gone right on this world, and if the reign of Kali had not made such progress, supported by the enthusiastic teenagers, women's livers, etc., great developments in medicine would have taken place. For example, there would have been aura photography, which would enable any trained person to diagnose illness even before that illness attacked the body, and then, by applying suitable vibrations or frequencies or cycles, call it what you will, the patient could have been cured before he was ill, so to speak. But money did not come in enough to enable me to carry on adequately with research. It is a curious fact that any crummy lawyer can charge $40 an hour for his time, charge it and get it, and a typist can charge $3 for typing a short one-page letter. She can get that too. And people will pay oodles of cash for drink, entertainment, etc., etc. But when it comes to helping in research, no, they gave it the office or something like that. So, the science of aura reading has not been able to continue as I had hoped. I can see the aura at any time on any person, but that is not you seeing it, is it? It is not your doctor seeing it, is it? And I had worked with the idea that anyone with suitable equipment would have been able to see the human aura. When one can see the aura, you can see schizophrenic people, how they are divided into two. It's like getting one of those long balloons inflated and then suddenly divided in the middle so that you have two balloons. Or one can see the approach of cancer to the body through the aura, of course, and then by applying the correct antidote by way of vibration, color, or sound, then the cancer could be stopped before it attacks the body. There is so much that could have been done to help the patient. One of the big troubles seems to be that everyone nowadays is suffering from money hunger. You get young people at school or college, they compare notes so they can decide which profession the law or the church or medicine will offer them the most money and the most leisure. And as things are nowadays with medicine, the dentists seem to have the most money. What was really intended in this part of the cycle of life was that doctors should be truly dedicated people people who had no thought of money. In fact, it was intended that there should be medical monks, 
men and women who had no thought other than to help their fellow men and women. They would be provided for by the state, given all they could reasonably want. They would be secure from income tax demands and things like that, and then they would be on call and they would do house calls too. Have you ever thought that a doctor who gets a patient to the office keeps him there perhaps four hours waiting and then sees him for a total of nine minutes? How can that doctor have an intimate knowledge of the patient's history? Boy, and that was written in the 60s. How can that doctor know of the patient's hereditary patterns? And it is not a doctor-patient relationship. It is more like damaged goods being taken to the factory for repair. It is quite as impersonal as that. And if the doctor thinks the patient is going to be more than nine minutes of bother, well, he just slaps the patient in the hospital, which is much the same thing as being an article sent back for repairs and being stuck on the shelf for some time. The whole system of medicine is wrong. And in a golden age to come, there will have to be something of what I have suggested, that is, that all doctors shall be priests, or at least attached to a religious order. They will be dedicated people, and they will be on call with regular shifts, because no one would expect them to work 26 hours a day, but people do expect them to work more than six hours a day, as they do now. One of the dreadful, dreadful things now is how doctors have several examination rooms. A doctor will sit in his office at one end of a corridor and, stretched along the length of the corridor, there may be four, or five, or six little cubicles, each with a patient in. The doctor has a very hurried consultation with the patient and then directs him or her to a cubicle. While that patient is undressing or getting ready, the doctor makes hurried visits to all the other cubicles. And really, it's a mass production affair, just like battery hens, where hens are confined in cages, tier after tier, row after row, and they're fed and fattened. Food goes in one end and the egg drops out the other. Well, it seems much the same with patients. The doctor's words of wisdom go in one end, that is, in the ears, and payment, either from Medicare or from the patient, flows in in a continuous stream. Now, this is not medicine. The doctor does not always keep his oath. Often he will go to the clubhouse and discuss the affairs of old Mrs. So-and-so, or laugh with his friends at how that old fellow wanted to and couldn't, so what's going to happen to his marriage? You know how it is. It seems to me that doctors get their license to practice and then they shut their textbooks forever and ever, and any further learning comes only by way of the pharmaceutical representatives who go around from doctor to doctor to doctor and try and drum up sales. The representative, of course, boosts all the favorable aspects of his firm's medications, but never, never does he tell about all the weird side effects which might occur. 
Look at that affair in Germany, when that dreadful drug was given to pregnant women and the resulting children were deformed, perhaps missing arms or legs or something else. One gets the same thing with birth control pills. Women get themselves hocused and hypnotized by all the talk that they can have their fun and not have to pay the piper by taking such and such birth control pills. Well, actual practical tests on the patients show that there can be serious side effects cancer, nausea, and all that type of thing. So now the pharmaceutical firms have gone back to their metaphorical drawing boards and they are trying to devise other methods of bulking the nimble sperm and preventing him from shaking hands with an eager ovum. When the time comes, there will be quite infallible birth control method. No, I didn't say abstain. The real method will be a form of ultrasonic emitter, which will be tuned to the exact frequency of the man or the woman, and it will have the effect of knocking the sperm on the noggin so that it will not be virile. In fact, the sperm and the ovum can both be neutralized by ultrasonics, if one knows how, and that it will not cause any trouble to either of the participants, he or she, but that is something which will come in the golden age, if there is a golden age. Pain is a terrible thing, isn't it? And really, the doctors or the pharmaceutical people have not come up with any real solution for the control of pain. A few aspirins doesn't do it. Demerol is only a very temporary thing with possible side effects. And then you get into the morphine or morphia range and you may get addiction. But I believe that the researchers should first of all take into consideration the theory that pain can be felt only by creatures with a nerve system. So they have to do something to put a barrier between the site of the pain and the receptor nerves. My own experiences in hospital as a patient have not made me admire the medical world because I was taken suddenly very ill with truly horrible pains and we were in a state of confusion because at the nearest hospital there was a technician strike or a nurse's strike or something of that nature and they were not taking patients. So Mama San Raab got in touch with the ambulance people. Now, as I've said before, the Calgary Ambulance Service is quite definitely unsurpassed. The ambulance men are highly trained and courteous. Not only that, they also have great consideration for a patient. I cannot too highly praise our ambulance men. I'm sure that Cleo and Taddy Rampa ought to kiss each one of them, and then they could say they have been kissed by Siamese cats, which would bring a blessing to them, wouldn't it? Soon. There came the screaming of sirens, which stopped with a choke as the ambulance braked outside the door. Very speedily, two ambulance men came in, carrying big black bags. They were not the ordinary ambulance men. They were paramedics, and the paramedics are the best of the whole bunch. 
They asked a few questions, and then did not bother to open their bags. Instead, they wheeled in their stretcher and put it beside my bed. With every care, I was moved on to the stretcher, and then we went down in the elevator and out into the street, where almost as quick as it takes to tell, I was put in the ambulance. Mama San Rampa sat in the front with the driver, and the other paramedic sat beside me. I was fortunate in having a brand new ambulance. It was the first time it had been used, and it still smelled a bit of new paint and new disinfectant. We drove along the streets of Calgary, and I'm not going to tell you the name of the hospital because, in my opinion, it is the worst hospital in Alberta. So let's call it St. Dog's Body. That's as good or as bad a name as any. I could think of a very suitable name, but I'm afraid that my respected publisher would blush. Hmm, can a publisher blush? And would want alterations made. Soon, the ambulance drove into what appeared to be a dark, dismal cavern. From my viewpoint, flat on my back, it seemed that I was being taken into an unfinished factory with a loading bay just to the side. It was darn cold there. But as soon as our eyes got used to the gloom, the ambulance men took me out of the ambulance and wheeled me along a dismal corridor, and everyone I saw seemed to have a fit of the blues. I thought, oh goodness, they must have brought me to a funeral home by mistake. Mama San Raab disappeared somewhere into a crummy little office where she had to give all the details about me, and then I was pushed into the emergency section, which seemed to be a long hall with a few plated bars supporting curtains, which were not always drawn, and then I was transferred to a sort of hospital cot thing in the emergency department. One of the paramedics, knowing my difficulties, said, Nurse, he needs a monkey bar. A monkey bar, by the way, is a thing that extends about three feet over the head of the bed, and it has a triangular-shaped piece of metal, plastic-coated, depending from a short chain. It is to help paraplegics, such as me, raise themselves to a sitting position. I've had one for years, and I have always had one when I've been in hospitals. But this time, when the paramedic said that it needed a monkey bar, the nurse looked even more sour than normal, and said, Oh, he needs a monkey bar, does he? Well, he won't get one here. And with that, she turned and walked out of the little cubicle. The two paramedics looked at me sympathetically and shook their heads, saying, She's always like that. Now there came the period of waiting. I was stuck in this minute cubicle, and each side of me there were other beds. I never got round to being able to count how many beds there were, but I could hear a lot of voices. Everyone was being made to discuss their problems, and hear the answers, in public. Some of the cloth screens were not drawn, and in any case they were open at the top and open at the bottom. There was no privacy at all. There was one frightfully funny incident, funny to me. In the next bed, to the right, there was an old man. He'd just been brought in off the street, and a doctor went in to see him and said, Oh, Grandfather, 
God, not you again. I told you to stay off the drink. You'll be picked up dead soon if you don't stay off the drink. There came much rumbling and muttering and croaking, and then the old man burst out with a roar. I don't want to be cured of the drink, damn you. I just want to be cured of the shakes. The doctor shrugged his shoulders in resignation. I could see it all quite clearly, and then he said, Well, I'll give you an injection. That'll straighten you out for the time being, and then you can go home again. But don't come back here again. Some minutes later, as I was lying on my hospital cot, a harassed nurse came skittering down the corridor. She dashed into my open cubicle, and without a word to me, without even checking to see who I was or what I needed, she ripped back the sheet covering me, grabbed my pajamas and pulled, and jabbed a hypodermic needle into my unsuspecting rump. Then, almost without breaking stride, she yanked out the hypodermic, turned on her heel, and was gone. Now this is absolutely true. I have ever since been wondering if I got the shot meant for that old drunk in the bed next to me. No one told me what was going to be done. No one said a word to me. But all I know is I got a shot of something straight into the... Well, there may be ladies present, but you'll know where I was stuck. Some time later... A porter came, and without a word to me, just grabbed the end of the cot and started pulling me out. "'Where am I going?' I asked, quite reasonably, I thought. But he just glowered at me and pulled me along a long, long corridor. "'You'll see when we get there,' he said. Mind you, I'm not an ordinary porter. I'm just helping out. Really, I'm in... And he mentioned another department. I have always believed, and always been taught, that one of the duties of a doctor or nurse or anyone connected with treatment is to tell a patient why a thing is being done and what is being done, because, after all... It's quite a serious matter to stick needles into patients' posteriors and leave them wondering what it's all about. We were going down the corridor, and some sort of a clergyman was coming along. He saw me and turned into a frozen-faced robot and averted his face. I was not one of his flock, you see. So he hurried off in one direction, and I was pulled away into another. The bed stretcher cot stopped, and a squeaky voice said, That him? The porter just nodded and walked away, and I was left outside what proved to be the X-ray department. Some time later, someone came along and just gave my bed a push, like a locomotive shunting tracks, and I rolled into an X-ray room. The bed was pushed against the table, and I was told, Get on there. Well, I managed to get the top half of me onto the table, and then I turned to a little girl who was there. I looked at her and wondered what such a young creature would be doing in such a place. She had on white stockings, and her mini-skirt was micro-mini-skirt, and was right up to her, the place in which I had been poked with the hypodermic. I said, Do you mind lifting my legs on for me? I can't do it myself. She turned and looked at me in open-mouthed astonishment, and then she said, very haughtily, Oh, no! Her tone turned to awe and reverence, and she said, 
I am a technician. I'm not one to help you. So it caused me extreme pain, pain amounting to agony even. But I managed to grasp my ankles with my right hand and pull them onto the table. Without a word, the technician just slammed about with her x-ray machine, setting buttons, etc., etc., and then she went behind a leaden glass screen and said, Breathe in, hold it, breathe out. I sat there for about ten minutes while the film was developed, and then Without a word, someone came along and pushed the hospital bed back against the table. Get in, she said. So again, with extreme effort, I managed to pull myself onto the hospital bed, after which this female pushed the bed out of the x-ray department and let it roll against a wall. There was another wait, and then... Eventually, someone came along, looked at the card on the bed, and without a word, pushed me back to the emergency department, where I was slid into a cubicle, just as one would push a cow into a stall. Eventually, after three or four hours, I was seen by a doctor, but it was decided they could not do anything for me. There was not a vacant bed in the hospital, except in the women's department. My suggestion that I would take that was not well received. So I was told to go home again because there was nothing they could do for me and I would be better off at home. You'll be looked after better there, said another one, and believe me, I needed no convincing on that. Mama San Raab had been sitting in a cold, cold waiting room on a hard seat the whole of the time, feeling, I suppose, like a castaway on a desert island. But at last she was able to come in to the emergency department, and then the ambulance was sent for to take me home. From here to St. Dog's Body is one and a half miles, and from St. Dog's Body back to my home was another one and a half miles, three miles in all if I can multiply correctly. But that little useless trip cost me seventy dollars, not the ambulance men's fault. But that is what the city charges for an emergency call. So I am now looking for another place outside of Calgary, preferably in some other province, because I am devastated by the crudity of medical treatment in Calgary. I am shocked by the cost of things in the medical world in Calgary. That brings me to another point. I believe that medicine should be practiced only by dedicated people. I believe there should be a weeding out of scrimshankers and shirkers among the patients because too many patients like to go to hospital emergency and sit in the waiting room as if it were a country club, except that no country club was ever so uncomfortable. I also believe that doctors and nurses, yes, even porters, should have more consideration for patients, and if they took the golden rule and practiced do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, then it wouldn't be such a bad world after all, would it? I would also have emergency departments where there was privacy, 
because I heard the story of the old man to the right of me, and I also heard the story of the young woman to the left of me. She had what I can only delicately refer to as sex problems with her husband, and she'd been a bit, let us say, torn. So the doctor examining her, who did not bother much about privacy either, was giving her advice in a loud voice, and asking her the most intimate questions in a loud voice. And I am sure that poor woman was as embarrassed as I was. But home again with Mama San Raab, Buttercup Rouse, Cleo and Taddy, I had a call to get busy and write another book, the seventeenth, which has the title of I Believe. Well, you know, I believe that this is a good point to finish the book, don't you? The End And the End of I Believe by Tuesday Lobsang Rampa Read for you by Blue Friend